Hey everybody, this is Sean Speaks. Today I want to talk about unveiling power and prejudice, Claudine Gay's Harvard struggle and the triumph of power over fairness. In obsession with the House Committee on December 5th, 2023, Harvard President Claudine Gay addressed critical issues around anti-Semitism. President Gay's remarks highlighted Harvard's collective grieving for the attacks victims and acknowledge an upsurge in anti-Semitic incidents. She underlined the dual necessity of battling hatred while upholding the principle of free speech. She reaffirmed Harvard's dedication to eradicating anti-Semitism in a revealing interview with New York Times on January 3rd, 2024. Harvard former president Claudine Gay offered a candid reflection on her handling of a sensitive issue. She stated, and I quote, for the opportunist driving cynicism about our institutions, no single victory or toppled leader exhausts their zeal. Yes, I made mistakes. In my initial response to the atrocities of October 7th, I should have stated more forcefully what all people of good conscience know. Hamas is a terrorist organization that seeks to eradicate the Jewish state, end quote. During the hearing, did any congressman specifically ask Gay if Hamas was a terrorist organization seeking to eradicate the Jewish state? And did she respond no? If I missed such a question, please let me know in the comments. I am puzzled as to why Gay would say she should have stated Hamas is a terrorist organization that seeks to eradicate the Jewish state when she wasn't explicitly asked to confirm this with a question. The animosity of Hamas towards the Jewish state is widely recognized given the long standing conflict between the two. What then was the issue with what Gay actually said during the hearing? Consider this, all groups, Jewish, African, Christian, Europeans, and others have histories marked by dominance, violence, and atrocities against other groups. Gay further disclosed in the article, and I quote, my character and intelligence have been unjustly attacked. My dedication to combating anti-Semitism has come under fire. I have been inundated with hostile messages, including death threats, and subjected to racial slurs more times than I can count, end quote. Consider the profound irony in Gay's situation. During her testimony, she neither demeaned Jewish individuals nor showed indifference or used derogatory language towards them. Despite this, she encountered severe backlash, including racial abuse and threats to her safety simply because her words did not align with certain people's expectations of what she should have said. Had there been a need for specific responses, more precise questions should have been posed. The reaction that ensued after the hearing transcends mere criticism, drifting into perilous territory where enforcing uniformity in thought and expression becomes the norm. This situation mirrors the public's response to Kyrie Irving, who faced widespread judgment for sharing a movie flyer on social media. Many hastily assumed his intentions, neglecting to fully grasp the context or engage in meaningful dialogue. The pattern of response is akin to a metaphorical crucifixion where individuals are judged prematurely, not for their actual words, but based on one group's interpretation of what was implied or what should have been said. This trend indicates a concerning shift in society towards quick judgments and the vilification of public figures, relying more on perceived notions than on concrete evidence. Gay further stated in this New York Times article, and I quote, when I learned of these errors, I promptly requested corrections from the journals in which the flagged articles were published consistent 
with how I have seen similar faculty cases handled at Harvard, end quote. The university couldn't justifiably fire her for her alleged writing errors as she followed the established correction process, a standard historically applied to non-Black scholars. Terminating her would have risked accusations of racial discrimination. The decision to demote rather than dismiss her is telling. It a, implies that plagiarism was not the true reason behind her removal from the presidency, but rather a pretext. B, shows that Harvard opted for the path of power over fairness, even though it had the opportunity to support gay. And C, highlights the urgent need for us to establish our own foundations and institutions that have power. This might be a realization has come late but it plants seeds of hope for future generations. It's time for us to see more clearly, to move away from the fog that has obscured our vision so we can truly embrace our identity and strengths, stepping beyond the role of the perennial underdog. Our pursuit of freedom and acceptance as Black people may have inadvertently led to a state of subjugation where we find ourselves settling for symbolic accomplishments and partial victories. This tendency might have diverted us from focusing on our intrinsic quest for true sovereignty and authentic liberty. Such empowerment resides in the realm of tangible power, a domain we have yet to fully embrace and claim as our own. As we reflect on Claudine Gay's experience at Harvard, I invite you to consider these issues more deeply. Has our need for others to be sensitive to us in words and actions because of past injustices, ironically become a tool that now works against us? This question is particularly important for us as Black people. Is it possible that our journey towards true power and freedom has been impeded because we've clung to a state of perceived fragility for too long? Emotionally, we might have been too caught up in seeking acceptance rather than carving out our own determined path. In America, the issue isn't about needing others' approval or acceptance. It's about respecting everyone's right to free speech, even when it challenges our own beliefs. The unjust demotion of gay serves as a stark reminder of how real power functions. It is steadfast in its self-preservation and often indifferent to fairness. How has one community on average transitioned from trauma to empowerment and significant influence while the other continues to grapple with the ongoing impact of its historical and current struggles. Much of this could be attributed to how each group has processed their emotions. Have we allowed words like the N-word to control us, thereby weakening our emotional resilience? A change in perspective might be key to shifting how we establish our presence and command respect rather than merely seeking it. We need to reach a stage where labels don't define us. Our responses should stem from our own choices, not dictated by others' perceptions. This is the starting point of building power, first on an individual level and then collectively. It's one thing to reject certain words because they are offensive, but it's an entirely different level of power to possess the financial means to restrict the use of certain words or to enforce consequences for unsaid words. Was it justifiable to demote gay under allegations of plagiarism? Certainly not. Yet this situation reminds us that power doesn't always equate to fairness. Is it fair that she lost her position as president merely six months into her tenure simply because she advocated for a balance between free speech and the protection of all groups from hate speech and ensuing violence? Again, the answer is no. But as history often shows, the exercise of power does not always align with the principles of fairness. Gay's narrative and the reactions to it are a wake-up call, urging us to reassess our collective identity. This is Sean Speaks, and remember, brain health is mental wealth.